All right, we're going to do section 9.1, sequences and series. This section is just an introduction to sequences and series. We've been doing some spreadsheet items, and the spreadsheet and the sequences and series fall right in line with each other. So you can read the cartoon, and then also see if you can, uh, on your computer, also look for Fibonacci numbers and parent sequence, and see what those all are about. You can pause now and go look for those. Then the next thing you want to do is do the warm up and go ahead and see if you can find these next numbers and then also write an expression for the nth term. Pause and go ahead and do that. And so for this sequence we have 36, 49, and 64. And then the rule for this is n squared because these are just n uh, squared for each one of these. This could be the first locker number I call it, second, third, fourth, fifth, and if you continue that on, you can take each one of these n values and square them to get the next term. And continue and go do the next two as well if you haven't done them already. For this one, this one's based on this, uh, this first one, and you can look and compare each one of these numbers. If you haven't figured it out already, stop and try to look at this again. Four compared to one, seven compared to four. Otherwise, you can also do the differences. This difference is 3, this difference is 5, 7, 9. As you can see, the differences go up by 2. That's another way to look at it. So we end up with 39, 52, and 67. The rule for this, n squared plus 3. It's the same as this sequence, but you add 3. Try this last one as well. And 108, 147, and 192, and that's just going to be 3n squared, three times this very first equation. In this lesson today, then, we're going to find the terms of a sequence, which is number one. Number two, find the nth term of the sequence by trial and error, understand factorials and using summation, and not some no summation notation, which is also called sigma notation, you can find partial and infinite sums and apply above to application problems. So first of all, let's get some definitions out of the way. Sequence is a listing of numbers. And it can be a listing of objects as well, but for our purposes, listing of numbers. Then the series is going to be sum of the terms of a sequence. And so those are the things that we're going to be dealing with mostly in the, these few sections of the chapter. So if we want to look at finding uh, the first five terms of a sequence, these are the values in each one of these cells, so to speak. And so when I say first five terms, I like to think, okay, one, two, three, four, five. And I'm going to take these n values and plug them in and get my a sub n's out. So if I plug in one into here, I'm going to get out three. Two, I'm going to get five. Three, I'm going to get seven, and so on. So there's my first five terms of my sequence. That's what I'm looking for. Go ahead and try some of these other ones, and then I'll just put up the answers for this to see how you're doing, so you can check. Notice that in number two, we just get an alternating pattern. You plug in one here, you get a three. Plug in two, this is being squared, so it's two minus one, so you get a one. Alternates back and forth. For the third one, it's going to alternate as far as the sign. So it's going to go negative, positive, negative, positive, and so on. And then you can just plug in the values and get those there. Now for number four, write an expression for the most apparent nth term of the sequence. So see if you can write rules for these, similar to what you did up above. And so what would be my nth term? Pause this and try that, and then I'll write these down. So for this first one, you look at the pattern and you jump up by fours. And so it's a linear pattern, so it should be a linear expression that will generate this. So you get the four for the slope, and then n, uh, times n, and then you got to figure out what makes it balance, and then so you got to subtract 3 to get back to this first term. So if I plug in 1, that's going to give me a 1. Plug in 2, that's going to give me my 5, and so on. 
The next one's tricky. To alternate like this, I need the negative 1 to the n like I had back here. So this would be negative 1 to the n. And so that would give me my first term to be negative. Oh, so I got to go n plus 1. So if this is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This one was tricky for me, but as soon as I put the numbers over the top, then I started sorting out what they look like. This one looks like a 1. This one looks like a, an 8. This one looks like a 27. I'm just off of those values. And then a 64 and a 125. This is the one that actually gave me away. So I'm going to take my value and go n cubed plus 1. That one's a little bit trickier because it's a cubic. Hopefully some of you figured that out. Okay, then let's move on to uh, getting a definition for factorial. If we do n factorial, this is equal to, many of you have seen this before, you take n and you multiply it by all its preceding integer values, where n is an integer anyways. Positive integer we're dealing with. And then we go all the way down to 1. So it's just any integer multiplied by all its previous integers. So n is greater than 0, uh, greater than or equal to 0, n is an integer. n is an element of the integers. And then some other things we need to know. 1 factorial is going to be equal to 1, because it's just 1 times itself, and that's it. And then uh, 0 factorial, we need a definition for that. 0 factorial doesn't make sense, but it will later on for your mathematics to make sense. 0 factorial is actually just 1. So if we write out the first five terms over here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Plug in the 1, so I'm going to get 2 over 1 factorial, which is just 1. And then uh, if I plug in 2, that would be 4 over 2 times 1, which would be 2. So that gives me a value of 2. You can simplify all these values. And then I get 2 cubed over 3 times 2 times 1. That is 3 factorial, which ends up being 6. And then you get 2 to the 4th over 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And you can do these in your head, but now all of a sudden I'm getting 2 to the 5th. It's starting to get a little bit more involved. So you can go to your calculator and work these things out as well. So if I go to my calculator, I can find 5 factorial by going to the math and then sliding back to the probability. And there is number 4 factorial. I can enter that and that's 120. Use that button if you need to, but you should be able to write these things out and understand factorial notation as well. Uh, these all you can simplify for, your, for yourself. Uh, then part B, you can write these out too. Go ahead and do that. And so for this last one, you might have gotten a lot of decimal answers. Uh, fraction numbers are probably a little bit better. And so what you can do is you can use your calculator to figure some of these things out. And so if I take uh, 3 to the 5th, That would be my numerator, and I have to add 1 to it. And so I get my numerator there, and then I divide by 5 factorial. So I can go to the math. Oh, I, I, I forgot to put it in the 5. 5, and then math number 4. And I get that. Oh, that's not the same thing as what I got, but... I love this button, the math button fraction. Woo, there it is, 61 over 30. That's how I got my last answer. And then we can evaluate using factorials on the next page. And so if I look at these values, I can write these out to try to simplify. That's what I want to be able to do. So this would be 9 factorial. So we say that this is 9 times 8 times 7 all the way down to 1. And these turn out very nice on how they cancel. And sometimes you can see better pictures. And then this is 7 on 6, all the way down to 1. But if you notice, 
this 7 all the way down is going to cancel with this one. So I didn't even bother to write that. Now I look at what I have left. 72 over 2 will give me 36. So you can simplify these out. Yes, you don't need to know how to do these by hand. Don't do them by calculator because I can make them big enough so they overflow your calculator. So on a test, you got to know these rules. So 3, 2, 1, and then 8 times 7 times 6. And then 4, 3, 2, 1. 4, 3, 2, 1, that goes away. And then if I have this 4 and this 2, that cancels with this. I suppose I could have canceled 3, 2, 1. And then this 3 can cancel with this. So I'm left over with... 42 times 5, which is uh, 210, I believe, and then you do that 420, if I have the right number there. Yes. Now, if it's in general, I can take n plus 1. The term preceding that would be just simply n, and then n minus 1. I don't want to do any more with this because I have n minus 1 here. These cancel, and so I'm left with n times n plus 1. That's all for that. All right, then we are at using factorial notation, and now we want to move over to summation notation. Summation notation, hopefully some of you have seen this before, but it is with a sigma. Sigma is a Greek letter for S. And what this means is that we take a bunch of terms and we're going to add them up. And so we start with a lower index, for instance, 1. And then we have an upper index, which is another number. This means that I will run from 1 to n. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to plug that in to whatever rule I have out in front here. So for instance, this whole thing is a compartment of many terms added together. So I'm going to take 1. And then I'm going to work my way all the way up to n. So it's a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot, 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 all the way up to a sub n. And if I want to do a specific example to show you, I could have the summation of i equal to, oh, I can start at 2. That, that works and then have a rule. So this would be 2i plus 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 2 and I'm going to start plugging it in here for i. So this is the first term. I started here at the lower index, took 2, plug it, plugged it into the rule here. And then I go to the next term, starting at 2 all the way up to 5 would be 3. So I take the 3 and I plug it in. So that would be the next term. And then I plug in the 4, and then I plug in the 5. So from 2 to 5, you think you might have three terms, but you're doing counting numbers, so it's 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 3, 4, 5. There's four terms total. And then this sum, you can work this out for yourself. This would be 40. Now, there's properties of these things. If I add a constant to itself over and over again, for instance, 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8 so many times, for instance, n times, all you do is take that 8 and we would multiply it by how many times you're adding it. So this would be 8 times n. So this is a rule for adding a bunch of constants over and over again. This one is if you have a constant times some other things. This is just the distributive property. If I have something in common with all these terms, I can factor it out. So this would be a C that's factored out, and you still have the sum inside. So this is representative of the dis distributive property. right? And then this one is the sum of two different sequences. Uh, if you put them together, you can also separate them out. That's just a commutative property that you're using. And finally, we have definition of an infinite series with summation notation. This just means that the terms go on forever. Here's an example that I'll have to do in class. Uh, but this sum, it's an infinite sum, it equals 1. Uh, this one is another infinite sum, and you get 5 tenths, 5 hundredths, 
and 